Now, you're welcome back to our little Sunday evening rugby corner. Last week, we had former Monster Rugby Duncan Casey on the show. If you missed it, you can go to the podcast section on the OTV Podcast Network, or you can listen to it on the Go Loud app, or as well, you can watch it back on our YouTube page. That's at Off the Ball on YouTube. And all of our rugby coverage, a reminder, on Off the Ball, brought to you by Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Now, this week, we have another hooker joining me. I'm delighted to welcome along a former Leinster and Ireland hooker, a British and Irish lion as well in 2005. Shane Byrne is with us. Shane, how are you? I'm well, and yourself? I'm not too bad now, Shane. Not too bad. Sitting at home at the moment, this is... This is the new normal. This is how we're doing things. <laughs> this is how everyone's life nowadays is. Although we're a bit strange. I'm in the waste management, so we're, we're classed as essential services. So I'm in the office as we speak. Uh, yeah, so we're still busy. Yeah, God knows what we'd be doing if you weren't doing your jobs. The, uh, everything yeah, would just correct. be piling up outside the door. Yeah, it'd be a little bit smellier, all right, yeah. <laughs> so life is normal enough for you at the moment, I suppose. You're, you're getting yeah. out of it. You are going yeah, to getting out uh, like the yeah, like all the anything that's perceived has been important to our business. I can still get out and do, and um, you know, there's guarded checkpoints everywhere. Particularly, I'm down the sunny southeast, so you know, anyone anytime there's a weekend coming up that they suspect uh, caravanners and holiday homers are going to be trying to sneak in down from Dublin. Uh, there's checkpoints all over the place, but uh, yeah, it's normal. And my wife is in the pharmaceutical trade so she's working a mix in between home and into the office so it's been yeah it's it's normal enough you know although i've twin 17 year old daughters at home which uh yeah is challenging enough keeping them entertained so you're happy enough to be honest going out into the office i'd imagine you i have no problem with that whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a reason we go to and added to that uh, I was due a haircut before it all started and now I can't, which I'm absolutely delighted about because uh, I'm able to grow my hair way longer than my wife would ever let me to normally. So I'm happy out. How, sh- how short does a Shane Byrne haircut actually go though? Oh, well, the same woman has cut my hair since I was 80 and um, she I don't really say anything to her anymore. I just sit down, she cuts it and that's it. So it gets, it gets, it never really gets short what most people would consider short, but it'd be short for me. But then I don't see her again for, you know, three months, maybe more. And uh, she just saw that again. And that's it. She certainly, had, she certainly hasn't put her kids through college with the money she's got from me, or from me, should I say, uh, cutting my hair. So you're not like a lot of the people at the moment who are uh, contemplating going for the old buzz cut. I'm getting towards that territory now. I'm, I'm a few weeks past my usual spot, and things are getting a little bit, they're getting a little bit dicey at the moment. Uh, yeah, I've seen some horrendous cases out there now of a few people, but there's quite a few people actually starting to lean towards the mullet, and they're not too upset about it as well. So I, I this could bring in a, a reverse way of getting the mullet back into fashion. So yeah, I'm happy enough. <laughs> so you're you're going to be a style icon when all this is over. You're going to be talking about how you were you were setting the trend twenty, thirty oh. years ago. Uh, you mean I'm not a style icon already? That's devastating news. <laughs> <yes. laughs> uh, quick question for you: How uh, what would you give to go and watch a game of rugby at the moment? Yeah, it's 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 mad. You know, when you do become a, a, a supporter again, and then you really get into it, and and you know you commentate in a few games, and then when it disappears over oh, years, small ears with the old earphones. Um, when you get into, you know, going to games regularly again, it, it's amazing the, the, you know, how much you do miss it, you know, and it's, it's, it just, it's the atmosphere around it. It's, it's still the, you know, being a player, you still, you know, you're looking at a different game than most people because you go, look, if I was into that situation, what you would be doing. And, and uh, but it's the thrill of the event that is certainly missing, you know what I mean? And it, it's, it's amazing that there's absolutely nothing going on. It's not even like a, a, an off-season. It's just there's no, no sport at all to, to feast your brain on whatsoever. But you're, back when rugby was still going, you, know, you, you do get the boots on every now and again. You do still talk out for, like you would have been playing in the, uh, the charity game, the Ireland Legends against England uh, yeah. back 
in back in London towards the end of February as well. So end of Feb, still yeah. Out as well. They must be they must be great games to be involved in. Let's say. Ah, they're great fun. Yeah, I organised them with Len Deneen, uh up for Munster, and um, they're brilliant. They're brilliant. Uh, look, they're they're a charity game. We've raised over a million sterling so far for charities, and they've been a huge, huge success. Um, but it's a great excuse from the personal side of, of it to get together with guys who you just would never see otherwise, you know, and you know, a lot of the, the ex English internationals have really grabbed it and, and are really Mike Tindall, I suppose, to the to the four. Martin Curry was one of the original, Jason Leonard. And these guys, like from year to year, you literally wouldn't see them. So like this is a great reason to get together for the weekend and look, it's for a great cause. But the physicality's still there. You know, you still have to do a bit of panic training and running, going into it. Normally, you do. You're looking at the calendar. You're going, "Oh, Jesus! This is it's two or three weeks away," and you have to absolutely train like a lunatic so you don't make an absolute fool of yourself out there. And um, you know, but it's they're still enjoyable, and it's still, you know, you still want to win the game. You still hope that your body's able to to do it, and it's amazing. One of the first things you, you, you learn when you're playing rugby as you get older is that your body spots or your mind spots something happening and your body just doesn't react. You see this guy come, you go, oh, I'm absolutely going to, oh, geez, he's gone past. <laughs> your body just didn't react at all. And uh, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. And I still try to play a couple of games for my local club here, Arklow, um, during the year. And um, yeah, just... Thankfully, the body is 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 touchable, still behaving itself. So uh, it's just a case of losing a few pounds that I found along the way and getting into a shape where I can still run around a little bit. When you're playing in those then as well, and you know when the opposition maybe might have a player that you know he's probably only retired in the last couple of years and stuff. In yeah, in reality, he's still fit as a fiddle. He's probably as close to you know a rugby player as you could possibly get, and you're there. You know, you've lads in their mid late forties. There might even be a couple of lads in their fifties. Yes. Let's say, I imagine. Oh, old uh, is what you what, mean. What's, yes. that, what, what's that like? What's that like when they're running at you and you're going, "Oh my God, I have to tackle this guy." Well, that's that's the I suppose the joy of it as well is because you can't like the way the way the rules of of the the classic or the legends rugby is is that it's uncontested scrums because everyone would be knackered if we're doing it, and uh, it's rolling subs. So the main reason for that is that guys can, you know, they're not as fit as they used to be and they can come off and get on. But after that, it's full on. So you cannot play it because of the exact reason you said it. You can't play it, um, you know, half-assed. You can't play it as if, you know, because there could be someone, as you say, who's, you know, late 30s, just finished, still is professionally fit, and him running through or at somebody is going to run full whack whether he thinks about it or not so you have to hit everyone with everything that you can every opportunity you get but the only difference is which is great is that there's no anger there's no anger in it you know what I mean where everything you did in the professional game particularly in international rugby you're you're playing with just keeping that redness down you're you're full aggression you're full trying to knock the socks off them and do whatever you can to them whereas this you still have to tackle them. You still have to do it as hard as you can. You still have to rock them out. But there's no anger in it. You're picking each other up off the ground after us. And you might get in the odd good hit. <laughs> you know, things like that. But that's, that's, the, you know, that's the joy of it. And that's why everybody, it's hugely popular. Like you could, if you had the time, if you had the wealth, and the, uh, you probably weren't married, you could spend your whole, the whole year traveling around the world playing legends or classic rugby. Every tournament now has a, has a, a classic tournament, particularly the tens. There's two in Dubai, Scotland, all the sevens have classic tournaments, you know, Las Vegas. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. Classic rugby because people love supporting the players who they all know. They all know who these guys are. They've spent years and years and years um, supporting them. And now they've just stepped back from the, the full line light and they can still do it. It might happen a little bit slower than they used to be able to do it, but the skills are still there and the games are brilliant. Now, and I imagine then afterwards the, the social element is incredibly enjoyable because, you know, you do get to spend a lovely evening with, 
guys, as you were saying, who you might have seen for, for 12 months Years. or even longer yeah, in yeah. some cases. Yeah. And I would imagine it probably brings in an element that people love as well. Of It kind of harks back to the days before professionalism when there was, I mean, some might criticise it, there was a decent drinking culture around rugby, but there was a real yeah. social culture as well. But that's that's one of the, the funniest things in it as well, is that, um, yes, it is. It's exactly as you say. The weekend is full on. In fact, I, I might go over for a Saturday game. I might head over on the Thursday just to make sure everything is in order, you know, <laughs> and uh, get a few warm-ups going into it. But we're, we're, which is a great thing, and it's actually interesting to see, we're starting to get the first few guys now, for the last few years, of guys who've never experienced anything like that. Guys who went from school to professional rugby and never experienced any of the fun that we had at amateur days and any of the real socializing, you know, even, even the guys who came in, you know, into professionalism, like Gordon Darcy would be one of the guys, he literally went to school professionalism, but he was still, you know, professional with us that we still had the amateur attitude and we were still going on for a few drinks, but there's a few guys now who've never experienced anything like that. Like, um, Strettle was playing with England. Uh, last time out and um, he's obviously never experienced that and they absolutely love it because the one thing about it and people always ask you know about current rugby players the breed of person that plays rugby is still the same person you know they still have the same point of view about fun about messing about having the crack you know they're still the kind of same type of guys and given the opportunity they all you know, enjoy the fun and, and the absolute pull and the piss that is hanging around a good rugby crew. And obviously, I imagine you would have had a lot of those those great days early in your career because I was saying, mm. so 1995 professionalism comes in and yeah. that's when the provincial system kicked off. I imagine you would have been playing a lot of AIL in the years prior to that with, was Black Rock your club, was it? Yeah, so I, I kind of, I went straight from school um, Left in, in 89, 1990 and then went up to Black Rock. And thankfully within the season I was playing, uh, the AIL, AIL was just getting going. And um, yeah, it was a great, you know, coming up in the, the ranks back then, the amateur, it gave you a great respect for the game because they were always in the teams on the way up. They were the older guys on the way back down. And they really taught you respect for experience and the knowledge that they had in the game where you were obviously coming up thinking you were invincible and full of confidence and a couple of the old Wiseland guys would uh, take you, <laughs> would, would take a few chunks out of you in training just to make sure you knew exactly where you were and it just you know I think it, it, it bred into me a great love of the game you know and, and that it wasn't just something that I was ambitious in or, or something that's um, achievement it was what you know my sole focus was I actually loved playing the game because of those days and yes look it was it was great fun you know after every game you know we 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 got on the tear with some absolutely fantastic guys and and we got to know everybody we played against and we spent time with them and um, you know a lot of those things that it is a shame that that's lost in a way but there's, there's kind of nothing you can do about that, the way the game, the way people are now about the game. And, um, but for me, it certainly gave me a great respect for the game, respect for the players around me and your elders and your senior players, but also a real, real love of the game. So with that Black Rock team in the AL at that time when you were playing in the early and mid-90s, what's... What division yeah. would they have been up around at that stage? Who else? Uh, would oh, there division been, like, one, yeah. It was division, division one, yeah, at the time as yeah. well. Who, who um, else would have been in that kind of crop? Oh well, oh that player wise, mm. or that our clubs player wise. Oh yeah, um, you know of international like Alan McGowan was there. Brendan Mullen was still there. He was on his last couple of seasons. Um, Alain Roland, Niall Woods, David Beggy. Um, Martin Ridge and under international centre um, Paul Wallace joined in around the early 90s and Paul Flavin um, you know it was an absolutely fantastic team and, and it was back when this was when Limerick was the real hotbed of, yeah. uh, of rugby back then and, and, and they were starting to spearhead the monster what became the monster push in, in Irish rugby and um, 
you know, the, the competition there was absolutely fierce. And we became one of the, I suppose, first teams. Now, we look, there'd be loads of debate about this from the Marys and the Lansdowns and everything like that. But we became one of, the, one of the sides that really started a challenge every year. We never quite got there uh, by winning the title. We had, I suppose, a, the closest thing to a playoff against Gary Owen uh, in, geez, was it 94? Maybe, I can't. You'd have to check when that years and that. And, you know, we got very, very close a couple of times. But it was a great time to play rugby. Rugby was brutal. Back then, you know what I mean? It wasn't as disciplined. And, um, you know, you you can see guys coming off the pitch now with, with very few knocks and bruises, you know, but you know they played an immensely physical game. But it's different back then. You know, it was, you could see the physical effects of, of the games and um, probably a lot more claret, as they say, and uh, far less rules. But it was still a fantastic, fantastic game. And those amateur days, you know, were, were good. It, it led in when, when the rugby went professional in, in 95. I was very lucky to be one of the first to get the contracts. And um, yeah, like we weren't prepared at all for professionalism we, it, it, they're just the setup wasn't there like I, I started playing with senior Black Rock in 91 I think it was and 92 93 I started playing with Leinster and back then Leinster was literally one man and his dog you know your, your, your parents the parents of the players you know a couple of cousins and someone else who wanted to go in for pints into Old Wesley after the game in Donnybrook and that's about it you know and it just happens to be because we were very lucky. Um, the IRFU seriously considered super clubs and going the English route of professionalism. And we were just very lucky that they decided to take what was the perfect setup is through the provinces, that the IRFU sits on top, the four provinces underneath. Now, obviously, the club game suffered immensely from it, but we were very lucky with the resources that we had that that was the route we took. Yeah, so like that's that's quite interesting you say that obviously because a lot of people would have said that you know club rugby and the the height that the AAL was at in the nineties and stuff. Obviously, there's been mm. such a drop off in terms of like the quality, the attendances mainly, and the money that was involved in it uh, around the time. So would you just kind of see it that the provincial system, unfortunately, it was it was it it, it was a necessary kind of a, a necessary evil as much as it uh, has you know, flourished Irish rugby and stuff. It did, it probably has done a lot of damage to, to clubs, but it is, is it just one of those unfortunately necessary things? Um, yeah, I think it probably started incorrectly in the sense that, um, uh, no, not started, it started correctly as in the way it used to be was that if you didn't have a game, so we would train professionally. And then if you didn't have a game at the weekends, either with, with Leinster or whoever, or you didn't get picked, you went back Thursday night, trained with your club, and you played at the weekends. And that was the that kept everything alive because people were still going back and seeing mm. these players who they were used to seeing, even though they were still professional. And the and the, the gap, the gulf hadn't hadn't widened at that point. That you know people then it became an issue of uh, professional trainers against an amateur player. But I think the reasoning behind that it shouldn't have never happened because if their interaction standards would have stayed high. But what happened was is more and more people got employed into the professional ranks, more and more coaches, and that the second tier became, it wasn't just about the first set of players, it was about academies and things like that. And unfortunately, the big mistake to me was that they started to be ring-fenced. And, um, you know, if you were hitting academies or you were a Leinster B or A player, whatever way you want to call it, they wouldn't allow them to go back to the clubs. They would, you know, they would ring fence them, make them training. And a lot of players became professional trainers because they just weren't playing an awful lot of games. And that's where the British and Irish Cup came from and things like that. And whereas there was a perfectly good competition in the AIL that could have kept them playing rugby week in, week out and would have kept raising the standard of, um, you know, the, the, to me, the domestic game. And that's where you know, I think mistakes were definitely made because then you had the attitude came because you you would next to never see a guy in his late 20s, 30, 30s playing AL. Very, very seldom nowadays. And that's also because they have a go and if they don't make it, they give up. 
Whereas if that culture of playing with players and maybe a chance someone might go and watch one of those guys coming back from injury or he's an A player trying to get on and you might get spotted, it would have kept more people playing the game as opposed to the bottom falling out of the players' numbers and the standard going down, which is an awful pity. Mm. would it have created a lot of kind of resentment among players and kind of friction when the professionals essentially were coming back into a team and walking straight in? Yeah, more so when it became, uh, uh, I suppose, a rare thing. Um, you know, when everybody was doing it, say in the early days, if there wasn't a, a Leinster game, we all came back. If, if, you know, when squads got a bit bigger in the professional era, like anybody wasn't picked, they all came back. So when it eventually got to the stage where, you know, you could potentially have very few guys coming back because they were ring fence in the professional setup and a guy would come back, coming back from injury and it would only happen once every blue moon. Yeah, you would, you would have seen a bit of resentment. And that's where the, you know, the, the debate with the, the do-gooders and then the guys getting concerned, you know, with the, oh, what about poor Johnny who hasn't trained like that and this big beefy lad is coming back. Whereas if it was happening regularly, it wouldn't have been a problem, but unfortunately, you know, the, the it just became something that is almost a, an absolute rarity now, isn't it? Like there was, you know, the it's very seldom that any professional player now takes the steps back via a club. Yeah, I think you only ever really see it now when someone might be coming back from quite a long-term injury. I remember even... A long-term, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like 2012 or 2013, uh, I remember, I'm, I'm from Limerick, and I just remember the hype around, I think Paul O'Connell had been out for pretty much the, the bulk of an entire season, and he came back, and yeah. everyone knew he was going to be talking out with, with young monsters some Friday night or something like that, and I mean, yeah. the, the, buzz around, the buzz around Limerick, ju- just for the sheer fact that one international yeah. player was, was going to be playing, was absolutely enormous. Um, but that, that but that's I, the thing. But that's the thing they lost. Like that, that is the thing that they they should have had because you also have, you know, imagine having, I don't know, the likes of Jordan Larmer if he had a weekend. You know, when he was on the way up, you know, that guys would go, oh, "Geez, I remember him." You know, playing against De La Salle or playing against Gary Owen. You know, and for whatever club, that's the thing that that you're missing now. That's the thing that is lacked because, like. It, it's 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 very much it was it was as well in I suppose these are strong words and not the way they're meant but like in the ignorance of it or the lack of knowledge you know if you think about it the, in Munster's downturn if you think of their mad heydays and everything like that when you know Munster domestic rugby was absolutely thriving coincided an awful lot with the professional side do brilliantly look at them now you know what I mean the last while the Limerick clubs who were the, you know, the absolute hotbed of uh, Munster rugby, you know, since the AIL slipped away, the attention has slipped away and the success has slipped away from the Limerick clubs. So has the professional game, you know, not been where it used to be. You know, I'm just using that as an example. It's the same everywhere. You know, that feeder clubs, the amateur game 
still has to feed in. You can't just have this ring, ring fenced entity. You still need the AIL clubs to be able to contribute. Um, can you define for me as best you can what was a professional rugby player in 1995? What was the day to day life of a professional <laughs> well, in, in 1995 <laughs> or 1996? Well, listen, <laughs> when, we, when we went professionally, we were taught, geez, it was fantastic. You're in your mid 20s and they handed you the keys of a Ford Mondeo. It was like, holy. God, this is fantastic. And we had, I think it was a 30 grand contract at the time, which was our 25 or 30, which was just fan, absolutely brilliant. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, and uh, I had just actually gone back to college to uh, do building services engineering to just add another string to the bow. And halfway through the the term rugby went professional and was offered a contract and I was <laughs> I was gone. There was no second thoughts. There was no, oh, maybe I'll consider it. And um, we were, as I said to you, we weren't set up correctly at all. Like literally we were handed a, uh, a sheet for the week's training and there you go, let's, where you go. Now you do that. You remember the gym in UCD and uh, best of luck, <laughs> get through that yourselves. And a lot of it was like that. And, and sessions, it took a long time for the Irish professional game to really get professional. Um, you know, we would, you would get up and you would have a program to do throughout the day. Uh, and we would start hang, meeting together so that it would get you out of the bed so you wouldn't just let your day slip away. And you might have trained in the evenings or afternoons. And um, very, very disjointed. Very disjointed. But um, it took... Once it started to get a grip, though, you know, once the guys got a couple of seasons into it, and um, you know, it, it, I think we made a lot of progress in the late nineties. I, I, I think from, you know, where there was a bit of begrudgery in the in the early years, with the prawn sandwich brigade, as as uh, Roy Keane would call them, that um, they. You know, it just, it was still the case that you would arrive to a game and, you know, you'd be at the hotel and it's still professional and, you know, 97s and stuff was Six Nations 97s, I remember. And I remember four buses going to the game and the first three buses were for the Alec Do's and the wives heading to the game. And the fourth bus was for the players to head to the game, you know, and uh, they were going off whining and dining. And like, it took a long time for that. And I think, you know, not skipping over the years too much, but I think a, a great watershed moment was was the loss uh, to uh, Argentina in '99. I think that was a real watershed moment in Irish, in the Irish opinions. But like, I was very lucky. Where look, I had had I was on the last great amateur tour, as I call it, uh, to Australia in '94, which was you know very very hard tour, uh, long and but. Like if you weren't playing the next day, it was compulsory on the tear. Absolutely, dirt trackers out you go, and then you'd be up at eight o'clock the next morning for no reason to do a bloody fitness session. It was madness, absolute madness. And then um, you know the the game uh, was in the I was in the World Cup in '95. I, I came out after a week, and absolutely amazing experience. And as you know, then the Southern Hemisphere teams had gone professional, really, at that point. And we could see how far behind we really were. So when we actually went professional, um, you know, there was a huge amount of ground to make up. Massive, massive. But they started to put the structures in place. It's funny you talk about, you know, being on an Irish tour in 1994 and things like the 1995 World Cup because, like, it's 2001 when you actually finally get on to, to make the, <laughs> your test debut yeah. at Ireland like how long how long had you been involved in squads like were you were you regularly being involved in the, the actual the day-to-day -day training sessions with Irish yeah, rugby yeah 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 <laughs> without yeah, getting never, to, to make that never, test appearance yeah I first got in the Irish squad in 1993 wow. and um, was never out of the squad for any length of time I think I'm one of the highest capped A players <laughs> of all time. I actually have a B cap, would you believe? There's uh you know when it went from Ireland B to Ireland A for whatever yeah. bloody reason they called it that. I have a B cap. I have a, a, a sub Ireland B. I don't know what the hell year that was. And um the yeah, it was a long time. I was I was in the squad the whole time. 
you know, outs every now and again. I got dropped twice because of my hair. Um, I was told when, when after. Was that? The, uh, uh, well, after the 94 tour, uh, Noisy Murphy met me going down um, the steps uh, and uh, he said, great tour, well done. I said, thanks very much. And he said, get your hair cut. I thought he was joking. Or, uh, no. <laughs> and uh, I kept going and uh, I was dropped out of the squad again. I dropped out of the squad then and then it happened again in, I was um, 97, I was in the Six Nations. And uh, was sub against Wales in the Six Nations. And um, yeah, same again, get your hair cut. No, cut, or gone from the squad. But I tell you, uh, you know, a long time between 93 and 2001, and um, mm. towards the end of the 90s, you know, as I saw, like, you know, there were several people, like obviously Keith Wood was always there. And um, uh, there were loads, Terry Kingston and Ross Nez. Dale and Alan Clark and you know you name it it wasn't just the one person like anybody was getting ahead of me and um, I was playing consistently with Leinster that whole time now obviously times I was playing bad times I was playing well but um, yeah I was getting very concerned towards the end of the 90s you know I became very very obsessed um, with getting a cap and um, you know thankfully it, it, it came around but you know, towards the end of the 90s, I was thinking, Jesus, I should have cut my bloody hair. You know, <laughs> I was starting to think that maybe it would pass me by, you know. And, uh, you know, when they say now, like a lot of the guys, you know, address your feelings and all that, like, uh, it, it, retrospectively looking back at it, yeah, I, I had gone into a really, really dark place in, in my obsession with absolutely getting to play for Ireland. It was just something that I wasn't handling very well. And, like, private life and everything had suffered from us very much so in the sense that just single-minded doing this and couldn't understand and was blaming all around me couldn't understand why it wasn't happening and um, go on and were you getting coaches kind of taking you aside saying look don't worry your time is going to come and it was just the case that the time wasn't actually coming uh, well yeah everyone who I would be involved with from a Leinster point of view club rugby or representative like I played on every representative side and you know everybody congratulations on what you're doing and well done but just the powers to be honestly you know obviously I have to take responsibility a lot of that for myself I didn't do what they needed me to do obviously but you know I obviously just didn't suit the, the picture and there was someone else who they would pick ahead of me so you know it, it was something that was very very frustrating for, for a huge long time and I remember it culminating uh, in the very very late 90s in fact it could have been 2000 I think it was 2000 and um, there's an old grizzly coach uh, I have had called Joe Mack Joe McDonald uh, guys from the club rugby would know him over the years and um, he I had him on the 19s and stuff like that. And he was one of these real old, you know, taught me never take a step back, always keep going forward, never show pain, you know, take punishment, keep going. You know, one of those kind of coaches mm -hmm. and um, very, very abrupt, very straight talker. And I was, um, we were been forced, if you remember around that time, uh, two-handed throwing came in into the lineup. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. Now I, I don't remember going, when it came in, but I actually yeah, remember yeah, it's watching probably be, it. Was it's probably game before club. your time. Yeah, yeah we did a classic game time. club. Um, we did a classic game club a couple of months back. Yeah, and yeah. It was from Ireland, France in 2000, but you could actually see yeah. the French hookers at the time. They were still reluctant to still go away from this one yeah. pro. Yeah. yeah. So in around that time, um, 2000 or whatever it was, and um, the I was been forced we were being forced basically to throw two handed and I had to throw so I had a bag of balls and I was in was actually in Black Rock uh, in myself in Strabrook just teaching myself how to get it and I was you know giving out and going off oh, for fuck this is stupid you know and here why am I doing this and the old coach um, came Joe Mack came along and uh, he said to me uh, what's up with you you know, because you could see, obviously, I wasn't too happy. And uh, I said, oh, geez, look, I'm just, you know, teaching myself this stupid two-handed throwing thing. And 
I said, look, I don't know where this is going. You know, I've been in the Irish squad for seven years and um, just can't get that step up. I'd been on the bench in Six Nations. I'd been on several tours. I'd been in a World Cup. Just couldn't make that step. And, you know, what ifs and could have and all oh, those terrible guys, they won't pick me and that, that, that. And uh, he said to me, what's the one thing that you want? I said, what do you mean? He said, what's the one thing you want out of your rugby career? And I said, I just want to play once for Ireland. I just want to play once. And then I can finish happy. Because I said, look, I'm thinking of finishing. I, I had the family business at home. I said, I th I'm thinking of quitting. So then he asked me that question. I said, look, just once, just play for Ireland. And he, in uh, along with several expletives, which I won't be repeating here, he just said something to me very direct. And he said, if you quit, you'll never be capped. He said, if you keep going, you never know. But stop worrying about it. Because the only thing is for sure, if you quit, you'll never be capped. And he said it a lot, as I said, a lot more firmly than that. But it was, and then he turned around and walked away in, his, in the manner that he does. And um, I remember standing there with a the ball in my hand. And it was just like a, a light bulb moment going on in my head. And it was just, stop worrying about the things that you can't control. Stop, you know, blaming other people. Stop just being so consumed with something. Just make yourself as good as you can possibly be if opportunity knocks. And uh, just make sure you're ready. And um, thankfully what happened within a very, very short space after that opportunity did knock. And uh, thankfully I was ready because I had stopped worrying about it and let the weight off the shoulders and just made myself as good as I could possibly be. We went on, I think, that season. I think we won the A Championship. And um, and then 2001, in the glamour fixture, that is Romania, away from home, <laughs> I got I got my first cap, which was just, I tell you, it was an experience like, like nothing else. I can, I can still... Still run through it minute by minute as I as I came on onto the pitch. It was like an, an out of body experience. What um what does it feel like? Even I want to even kind of go before that match when the team yeah. is being called out and you hear, you know, number one whoever, number two Shane Byrne. What's yeah? What's that well, like? it wasn't that. You don't know. No, listen, remember I was well down the ranks, so it was Frankie Sheehan was starting the game. Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, was it the was the bench that day. Yeah, Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, the, but listen, I didn't care for God's sake. Yeah. But, but during um, the game, then during the game, then when yeah, you get so called over. And... Was, I'll tell you, there's a little bit more to it than that because typical, nothing in my life is straightforward. Everything <laughs> has a bleeding story to it. But I was getting married six days later, uh, in, in in June of 2001, and um, the my they couldn't fit my stag in, so. The stag, my stag party went over to my first cap. So they were having my stag party while I was in the hotel getting ready for the game. So there was about 16 of my gang went over there, and uh, which unfortunately was a bit odd, uh, included my mother and my sister. It was, it was a weird stag, <laughs> all right. And uh, they were off having, having an absolute ball. And um, when I was just getting ready, and, and I'd basically been told Warren got this is one of one of Warren Gatton's last games, and they just said, "Look, it's, it's going to happen." So I was getting huge congratulatory things from loads and loads of people that it's going to happen, but I still couldn't believe it myself, and was very concerned about it because um, in the game I'm rambling here a bit, but in the last game before that against Cork Con in the AIL, I had done a, a grade two tear on my medial ligament to my knee. And a grade one tear on my uh, ankle ligaments on the opposite leg. And so I wasn't exactly in great shape. But uh, Aylby, who was the physio, said, look, if you, do, if you can take the pain, I'll get you through it. Because there was a huge, you know, people just, everybody was hoping it would finally happen. So my stag, my stag were over on the other side of the pitch. Now, this is Romania. It's a 60,000-seater stadium uh, with those tiered concrete. Uh, levels, you know what I mean? No, no covers on it. Very, very hot. And uh, there were about, well, I'd say in total, maybe a good 400 people at the game. 
you know what I mean? <laughs> just really rugby was huge at the time. And um, I remember uh, Warren into the second half said, okay, you're on. And um, so it, I, when I finally got onto the pitch, the, I just, I, I can honestly, I can feel the emotion of it. I can see myself playing. That's the way I remember it. It wasn't that I was down there playing it. It was I was having this out of body. I can remember looking at myself going into the first scrum and you know, just an absolutely incredible sensation that look it had finally, finally happened. And um added to it was the uh my stag crew had been obviously enjoying themselves as they've realized beer was twenty pence a pint. And uh they were very boisterous over the other side of the pitch. And where was the first line out I had to throw in my in, into yeah in my international career was over directly in front of them, directly in front of them, and it was the first time that they had been anywhere near quiet for the whole game. But thankfully, I, I threw it through. I listen since then, I've thrown in front of 80,000 people on my own line, been two points down in the game or up in the game. And I've never felt pressure like that in all my life with having family and friends looking at you. But thankfully, Mick Galway caught the ball. We were all happy. Every, everybody won. And uh, yeah, just such a relief. Such, such a, I cannot tell you the relief after when I sat into the change room and, and it just dawned on me that, you know, finally I could call myself an Irish international. It just was. An, an absolutely amazing experience. And in terms of your own game then, did, like from what you can see on the on the fixtures list and stuff, it seems that from then, from well, I suppose maybe from the, the Six Nations the following year, you were pretty much mm-hmm. a permanent fixture, either starting or coming off the bench. Did, did mm-hmm. something kind of click for you on a professional level once you actually managed to get out onto the pitch and play in a test match? Um... Well, I suppose, not talking flippantly about it, but because of the conversation I'd had with Joe Mack and what they'd done, I was ready. You know, I, I, I was ready. And um, I had made sure my skill set was exactly where it needed to be. I, I always made sure I'd be one of the hard working, the hardest working people on the pitch and training and wouldn't be happy with something unless it was done exactly right. You know, a lot of the guys in Leinster would probably call that that's just grumpy and um, you know but that's that's the way it was 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 pure and simply um, just the fact of I was so hungry to get it that the standards that I wanted to everyone else to do I was very much in the in the area of like if one person does it everybody should do it and um, you know it was so when we went in and I finally got into the squad and we were involved in a great period of rugby there. And we had a, a really young team that was um, made up of a, of a lot of really, really good players. And it just was the right time for somebody to settle into a team. And, and, you know, everybody wanted to be successful. And it was the, you know, Eddie O'Sullivan was, became the coach and everybody moved on. But from, personal point of view I wasn't scared of working I had changed my game several times over the years from ball carrying to not ball carrying and you know just workhorse stuff and, and took over the, the you know the line out I'd called every line out I'd ever thrown into and we just we just made sure it worked and it was a it was a fantastic time to be involved um, you know in the game in the Iron Jersey And I can't imagine then when you were out on the on the pitch in Stradbrook practicing those lineouts, wondering in your head, should you call it a day sometime? I can't imagine you would have thought within a few years then, not only are you playing for Ireland, have you played, you know, are you getting 40 plus caps, but you get to go on a Lions tour in 2005. What was, what was that oh, called? Like? Yeah. Oh, listen, for God's sake, that was, um, yeah, surreal. Like it, it, it was, I'd always, I'd always played second fiddle to, um, to you know, I always thought in my career to, to loads and loads of people, and and sometimes rightfully so, and you know all the way through, and to all of a sudden be in a spot where, like, I can honestly say, honestly say, I never ever ever dreamt that I would play for the Lions. It was not not a dream I ever had, 
because all I wanted to do was play for Ireland because the Lions was, was a place where, you know, the legends lived. That's where the Willie John McBrides and the Fergus Slatteries and all of these guys lived. And, and you know, to, and then you're, you're playing away in 03 and we're going well and we're setting records and we're, we're beating teams that we've never beaten before, like Argentina and, or, you know, sorry, or, or Australia and South Africa at home and we're starting to catch the eye and things are going well in 04 and we get the triple crown in 04 things are going well we have a really good November series I think we beat South Africa and I can't remember it's even memory and you know think, and then you're all of a sudden you're thinking Jesus will I allow myself to even think that you're in with a shout you know what I mean that there's a chance here that you could possibly get to go on a Lions, you know, I don't know, no, just keep the head down, keep the head down, keep going, <laughs> keep going. And um, and that Six Nations, we, we played, we lost to France, um, which, you know, knocked the socks out, I took the wind over sails quite a bit. And we went over to Wales and we lost, they were going grass and we were going trip ground. And, uh, we, you know, that you were kind of thinking, crikey, you know, has uh, those two games, has, has the opportunity slipped past? And then you, you get a call. The first, how I found out, well, then firstly you find out that, that Clive Woodward is, is basically taking every player who played professional in the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere, the biggest squad that ever was, which I'm thankful of because you never know, that could have been the only reason I got to go, but who cares? And um, I, I first found out all within milliseconds of each other but the team was announced and uh, I saw it on CFAX. Do you remember? You would know CFAX. I do, yeah. No, yeah. no, no. Tele I was, teletext. You know as, a kid, I was, as a kid, I was very much addicted to, to yeah. Airtel and CFAX. Yeah, yeah. And it came up because it, there were calls been made as well, but somewhere or whatever the call was out. But I did what a lot of, you know, Irish guys did. I, when I got the call, I thought it was someone acting the Aegis. You know, uh, and uh, it was Bill Beaumont, and I hung up on him. I didn't know it was him. I thought it was some lads acting the acting DJ because I didn't know you got a phone call. And uh, eventually, I uh, called back, and it was Bill and saying you're 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 traveling, which was just my God, it's it's just incredible. Like to 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 be honest, and um, it's amazing. It's amazing when you get the the switch for it because then it, there's all the Ferrara about it and all the photo shoots and you know all you know I think there were 10 Irish players and what was there six from Leinster or five from Leinster I can't remember and um, you know, but then you get over there and, and they say amazing um, thing when you arrive in the hotel over there is that they say from this moment you are a lion that's like Oh jeez, you know it's it's just that's incredible. Like from from that moment on, and that that was a real moment that you're thinking to yourself, "My God, you know this is incredible." But then the the professional side you kicks in, and just being a line isn't good enough. You have to get in that testing, and you will do whatever it takes to get on that testing. You know, and then it's it's just like a mini a mini career. You, you, you have to squeeze a whole career into a really, really small space of time. That's the way I looked at it. And, uh, you know, the, thankfully I achieved what I needed to do, you know, to that point with Ireland. But I still had to, now I was in this hunt, I had to make sure I achieved the test. And, and as you joked, kind of when we first brought up the lines there, Clive Woodward picked an utterly enormous squad. And, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of joking. Like, are, are, you, are you thinking at the time, like, you know, God... I'm here because he's picked every professional rugby player he's playing. But is the fact then that you actually are involved in the test team and you like you featured in all three tests, does yeah. that kind of put a bit of reassurance into you that, you know what, I'm not just here because he's picking everyone. I'm here because I'm actually good enough to be here. Yeah, you kind of have that thought for, for a couple of milliseconds at the very start. But then it, it doesn't matter how you got there. It's what you do when you get there. That's that, and then, that and then the All Blacks kill you, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing trip. That you know, it was such a massive, massive squad. There were a lot of very odd things in it, and a lot of amazing things. Like, look, it's a Lions trip. It was still absolutely amazing. But the, you know, there was a couple of errors in it that Clive Woodward made a commitment to every player, 
that you would all get the same amount of time on the pitch before he picked his test side. And that was a mistake because he kept doing that almost right up until the tests. And what happened was, was that the test team never really played together at all, right the way up. And then he ended up just reverting back to the majority of the team that he could pick that won him the World Cup in 03 with a, with a splatter of, of us's in it. And um, the team had no continuity, anything like that. And, and a bit of panic had swept through the squad from paranoia, from uh, New Zealand spies. And, you know, from my own point of view, they changed the line-out calls the week running into the first test, which was an absolute, absolute disaster. And uh, I knew when I called the first line-out in the first test, and I'm looking down the line out, and particularly at the guy who was meant to be catching it. And I'm looking at a blank face looking at me, and I thought, oh, <laughs> we're in trouble here. And unfortunately, it was the it, 10 line outs I think we lost, which I've never done in my life. And um, it was, yeah, that first test was an absolute nightmare. But like up until then, it had been amazing. Like we, we had, you know, it was one of the most successful tours leading into the tests like we had been extremely successful only losing to the Mary All Blacks and um, you know a lot of positivity going through it but you know because of the disjointed like for instance uh, Mal who'd be one of my mates obviously and I'd know for as long Mal O'Kelly like at one point in the tour I didn't see him for a full week and we're on the same tour never laid eyes on him you know and that was just what they had divided it up and there was you know, midweek tour, midweek massive as, as it got to be known as they named themselves. And that created a bit of rivalry and uh, a lot of the midweek massive had a lot of the Welsh players on it, even though they'd won the Grand Slam. And there was a, a lot of, you know, not animosity, but just, you know, one upmanship, people just trying to get, you know, it, it just became that the focus wasn't just purely with the Lions within the squad, and uh, which was a shame. But it just gave us zero opportunity to get a test team together to the way it should have been, to the level it should have been at. So on the pitch, a bit of a disappointment, but the fact that you're there and, you know, I imagine having the jersey. Do you still have the jersey at home? Ah, yeah, absolutely. It hasn't gone up, though. Yeah, uh-huh. no, I haven't. I haven't. The rugby career hasn't settled with me just yet. Those demons are still there, I suppose. But... Um, the, yeah, an absolutely amazing experience. Look, I, I you know, I, I'm very well aware that, look, my whole international career was, was four years long, and that was it. You know, I, Romania away in 2001, Romania at home 2005. And in that time, I squeezed in a, a Triple Crown Lions tour and um, 41 caps. I, you know, I'm a very, very lucky man. Um, I would have loved to have added more to it. But unfortunately, that wasn't to be because um, I was, you know, going through while on the Lions tour, um, a very uh, unwanted um, split from Leinster, which was, um, you know, really, really hard thing to go through. And obviously that led to uh, a final question, I suppose, before we wrap it up. I moved to Saracens yeah. for you. You capped off the last couple of years of your career. I imagine, as you hinted there, very, very difficult to leave Leinster, but uh, had you other options on the table? Was it nice to to experience something a little bit different for maybe for the last couple of years? Um, no, I would have preferred to stay with Leinster. Um, it was something I didn't want to do. I'd been there for 14 years. I had reached so many milestones with Leinster. I never wanted to leave, but... Unfortunately, as I said to you, we said a long time ago, I, in contract negotiations, we, I had never been a big player to get a, a decent wedge or anything like that, always sitting behind everyone. And when my contract was up at the end of the 05 season, having just been selected in the Lions, I was offered a 30% reduction for a one-year contract, which I just couldn't take. I had new family. Uh, you know, I was hoping to get the first opportunity of getting a decent contract and that just didn't happen and I actually went into that I couldn't believe that I was going to sign with someone else that I played the the first test uh, unemployed I, I, I hadn't signed for Saracens I just didn't want to go and uh, 
they were great people. The, the Saracens people, I knew quite a few of them uh, through different routes. And Mike Ford was obviously out there, was coaching as well. And Richard Hill was there. And, um, you know, didn't regret picking that club as opposed to anyone else or Wasps or anything like that or any of the other clubs who were there in France or whatever. But it was just... The wrench from Leinster was was massive. I, it was it was horrible leaving, and uh, so the first year over there was hard, very very hard. But the second year, in which nobody, I didn't realize back then, and no one had really talked about it, that. Really, if you leave Leinster, you leave Ireland, as we all know now. If you leave Ireland, you're you're more than likely parking your international career, which I didn't know, and no one had really said it to me. And um, you know, so that was hard in the first year, but the second year was good. You know, settled in, got over the the horribleness of the move to start with. Lived in a fantastic place. They were, they were a really progressive club. We know we know the, the extents that they brought that to now. But, um, you <laughs> they know, look after they, their they, players, they, basically. They look after their players. <laughs> they do, but like that's you know that stems from the goodness. Now they took it too far, no doubt. But they they even when I was there. Uh, they're, they were madly intent on taking care of players after rugby. They were making sure that you were set up. The owners owned a myriad of companies. And if you had any interest in, in anything that they did, they really made sure you were set up that when, if or when you retired, you'd be ready for what happened afterwards. And, and that obviously rolled in and became what it became afterwards. But even back then, they were, before they became the behemoth that they were, they, they were still very much intent on that. All right. Well, Shane, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on for almost the guts of an hour at this stage. Yeah, very sorry about that. Time. Sorry about whinging on <laughs> at you for ages, yeah. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure having you on the show and uh, stay safe and all the best to you and the family over the next while. Take care, guys. Stay safe, yeah. So that's Shane Byrne, former Leinster, Ireland Lions and Saracens hooker as well. Uh, if you missed any part of this, you can podcast it all as well on uh, the OTB Podcast Network. Just check it out on offtheball.com or on the Go Loud app as well.